Hey everybody, in the CPTSD podcast season three opener, we're going to talk about something really important to the recovery of complex trauma, and that is the idea of a spiral recovery. Um, I've got a couple of really interesting announcements and things that are changing up at the very beginning, but hang in there until about three minutes, 45 seconds when I start talking about my dad and how he showed up unannounced at my house right before Christmas. And that may not seem like a big deal to you, but I've gone no contact with my family. So that was a surprise. I can't wait to see you inside. I look forward to connecting and hope you learned some great things today. everybody to the CPTSD podcast. This is season three, episode one, and I am Tabitha Bird Weaver, your host and licensed psychotherapist and researcher specializing in the treatment of complex trauma. We are so grateful to still be having a strong reception to this podcast, and I want to thank everybody who has Um, liked, shared, saved, and commented for us. Um, It helps us know that you're enjoying the content and it also helps to spread the word to others who might need to know about CPTSD recovery. So if you don't mind, like, share, save, subscribe, whatever platform you're using, that helps this message get out there. Thank you again. This is my first episode solo. And um, as some of you know, last season we said goodbye to Beth who wanted to increase her range of choice in life and um, and follow some other pursuits. And so I wanted to let you know she is doing just that. And uh, she and I have just finished a paper with Dr. Gregory Brown out of the University of Nevada at Las Vegas about advanced integrative therapy. So we're looking to publish that. Um, I thought you might enjoy that update about Beth and extending heartfelt thanks and gratitude to Beth for starting this journey with me and getting this podcast rolling. So we look forward to hearing from you in the future, Beth, and uh, checking in to see what's up. Speaking of AIT, this is my last announcement, and then we're going to dig into what happened right before Christmas when my dad showed up unannounced at my door. Uh, And for those of you who don't know, um, no contact with my family. So that was a big surprise. And I want to talk with you about what happened and what happened next. But first, for those of you who are professional therapists or in the healthcare or helping field, uh, I wanted to let you know something exciting that there is an advanced integrative therapy basics class coming up really quick in January. It's the weekend of um, weekends too of the 21st. Well, just making sure I got it right. Yep, 21st and 22nd, as well as the 28th and 29th. My esteemed colleague, Lisa Boker, will be leading the class and teaching you the basics of AIT, and it is enough to get rolling with AIT in any kind of practice that you might have. So I'd encourage you to consider that, and I will be there. I will be the um, teacher's assistant and um, popping into rooms to offer support when it's needed. So if that is something that interests you, please go to advancedintegrativetherapyinstitute.com. And uh, just Google that and it'll come up and the seminars are right there under Learn AIT. All right, we're going to move into um, what happened. Uh, Right before Christmas, my dad showed up unannounced at my door. It was surprising. And um, I want to talk with you about why that's not okay, what my experience was as somebody who is in recovery from CPTSD. And um, trust me, by the time we get to the end, you'll understand how this can help you as well. So my dad showed up unannounced right before Christmas, which is the anniversary of me going no contact with my family. It has been about five years up until this Christmas, uh, and I have really not had any contact with him. And we can talk about the story later about why that happened. You'll hear all about it over time. Um, But it was surprising and shocking. And um, I was uncomfortable, but I wanted to let you know a couple of things that came out of it. Um, And certainly he was uncomfortable. And also, just a sideways disclaimer, my family does not agree with anything I'm going to say right now. Um, So you'll have to decide how it resonates with you. I just wanted to put in there that this is not their opinion. Um, So... One of the things I heard growing up was 
you're going to listen to me. And for me, that was usually accompanied with some form of physical coercion, grabbing my neck, pinching my shoulder, lots of different options there. But um, I hated that. I hated hearing that. And I am an obstinate truth teller. And many of us cycle breakers are. And so I would say, no, I'm not. And then I actually would have to end up doing that because he was bigger than me and in charge of my entire life as a kid. So we got to a point in the conversation, which was probably three minutes long at the most. Um, it may actually be much shorter than that. I don't I don't know. That's one of the weird things that happens when you go into a shock, right, is that you kind of get lost in space and time. And that adds up to symptoms of CPTSD or complex trauma. I'm going to try not rabbit trail too much, but I still get a little bit of a charge because it was surprising to me that I opened my front door and there he was. And uh, at the end of the conversation, he let me know that he was not sorry or even understanding of any of the damage that had been done to me by him um, and that I was still the problem. And he said to me, you're going to listen to me. And I said, no, I'm not. And I shut the door. And I didn't even slam the door. I just shut the door and I walked away. Um, and he left. And I haven't seen or heard from him since, although I've heard from some other people who love me that there's an active smear campaign going on. Just Google that. I'm not going to go into it right now. But there's a smear campaign against me going on on social media. And I'm smiling because I have been there and done that. And it doesn't impact me anymore, which is absolutely infuriating to him, I'm imagining. I'm digressing. I wanted to let you know, from the perspective of somebody who's been in recovery from CPTSD for a long time, and working on it for a long time, that I have some insights about what happens. I also wanted you to know that I totally blew it in one of the stages of my processing, if you can do such a thing, but I had a realization that I was still unhealed and wounded in some areas. And I know I'll have that realization again. Um, and that's okay, because I know what to do. The first thing I want to let you know is that I absolutely, absolutely used my skills to manage the shock, to manage the rage, to sort out the emotions that I was having during and after the experience. And so when you hear people who are experts in recovery saying you need to learn these tools, it's real. And they're tools that we weren't given as kids because of the exact situation that created the problems we have. It's really messy. And so if you admire somebody or you feel like some advice or insight is helpful for you as you're on this journey, I encourage you to try it. Learn some skills. The ones that I am going to preach the most here, as you probably or might know by now, is watch your breathing. Uh, the first thing I noticed is I wasn't breathing. And it was the same old pattern I have, which is to exhale all the air and then not breathe back in. We all have a different pattern. Notice what yours is. So got that breathing on board. Um, I then noticed that I felt trembly and shaky and I allowed that. I kind of like relaxed into it and it got kind of big shakes. But those shakes are some of that charge of shock. I mean, think about an electrical shock, right? It has a charge leaving your physiology. And one example that's been used a lot of times to demonstrate this is, for example, when a gazelle is chased by a lion and survives, they will usually have a tremble session afterwards where they really shake. And that expels a lot of the shock charge that they've just had from the adrenalized state. So um, used breathing immediately. I also used comfort of my partner. And so if you have somebody that you can receive comfort from, please seek that out. Because nurturing is one of the things those of us who were neglected didn't get. Uh, so that was important. And I also did some energy psychology interventions. And the very first one I did, I, I just want to teach you right now real quick. It's called the FO hold. And what we're going to do is put one hand here. This is frontal right? F and then one back here, occipital. And if you aim for just where your thumb is just on the curve of the back of your head, that area back there is also right where your vagus nerve starts. And so just go ahead and hold it and breathe. 
I even right now can feel relaxation and let it go and you can do that as much as you want and for as long as you want for me what I've noticed is that at the beginning of my recovery I had to hold that for sometimes a minute minute and a half before I even felt like I could think straight or had any sense of release or relaxation um, now I am practiced and my body knows what to do and so it's maybe 10 to 15 seconds even after a big surprise like somebody showing up that you didn't expect and don't want there so um, FO hold it's a winner another energy psychology um, intervention that I did right away was come to these sore spots on your chest and I'll talk more about this and have talked more about this so you can find info on it um, but not right now because I'm moving through just rubbed this area noticed that it was tender and then there's a statement that I have it's a basic statement of energy psychology which is basically even though this thing just happened and I feel torn to bits and mad I'm okay and I love myself and so I did that, and I, I encourage you to go ahead and do it right now. Um, if you're very, very tender in this area, you can actually massage off your body, and that will have an impact. And so if you don't believe me, um, give it a shot. See what happens. Uh, try it anyway, because right here is a very soothing, relaxing uh, acupoint and a neurolymphatic area, as well as large ganglia coming off from that vagus nerve, all right here intersecting. And so stimulating that while you're having a cognition shift is really helpful for not only calming your neurology, but stopping any further traumatic response from building or rebuilding. So give those a shot. Anyway, back to the story. The next thing I had to do was recognize that um, where the emotions were coming from. Is this current emotion and new or is it old triggered emotion? And um, for the rage that I was feeling, I was really mad. I mean, I was like having to move around to let it out of my body. I realized, <clears throat> excuse me, that the emotion was current. Like, he totally violated the boundary of don't come to my house unless you're going to unequivocally apologize to me. Not only did he not do that, he blamed me again for the whole experience, right? So that made me angry. And, and that's appropriate. That's an appropriate response, right? So I let that energy out, recognized what that anger was about, and... It was just that for that one that was just angry you know we get a lot of talk in our therapeutic world about anger being secondary emotion and it is it's definitely an emotion that covers things up that one was just me being angry because that was inappropriate and i was violated again one of the symptoms that i noticed right away that taught me that or made me realize that i needed to do the energy holds and the breath work is that i had an experience of derealization and what that means is i felt like how that couldn't have just happened that wasn't real did that really just happen and for me there's always a little bit of like i feel like i'm out of my body just a little bit when i get that experience um, and so that let me know that i was starting to dissociate or have distress and so i calmed it right back down in and then I noticed after that, um, like on day two, um, the day after, that I was feeling pretty hypervigilant about things, and so particularly emotional things. And so I was super sensitive. And like, if you looked at me sideways, I was the worst person in the world. <laughs> and so I had to recognize, okay, I am beating myself up in an old emotional pattern that isn't relevant anymore. And I did my work around that, and so that resolved. But there are some longer consequences that some of us have. Maybe you don't, but I, I would encourage you to listen because someone you know probably does. I also have chronic immune issues because of my ACEs, my adverse childhood experiences and how I dealt with those. Um, and so I became inflamed because my whole body was like, warning, warning, this is not safe right? Be aware, be aware, be aware. And so that came with a joint pain. It came with fever. It came with fatigue. And so those pieces took longer for me to heal from. I was, I was inflamed for two or three days. And the only thing that I can really do once that happens is soothe it, right? 
So when you're thinking about symptoms of CPTSD, please think about a broad range of symptoms in your life, like emotional reactivity, like I was just describing, or hypervigilance, where I was really aware of what everybody meant when they were talking to me. Like I couldn't trust that they were just being authentic. Um, and that derealization where you're in shock, or maybe you feel like I'm not here, am I real? That would be depersonalization. So those are some ways to know when you are triggered and it would benefit you to pay attention to what's going on. So um, I wanna tell you about this experience during this where I was like, what the heck am I thinking? Um, I was really trying to figure out how to keep my son safe through this process. And so um, I, I wanted to write a card to my father in particular. Um, and do you know that by the time I got to writing that card in the middle of it, I was saying thank you to him. And there are some things that I am genuinely thankful for. He did feed me. Um, he did clothe me and take care of all of those physical needs. Absolutely. I also learned a lot from my dad. I know a lot about a little, or no, a little about a lot because of him. Um, and I certainly know enough about cars and construction to be dangerous, but not actually good at anything. More to the point, I recognized that I was thanking somebody who had literally just violated my boundaries and then told me it was my fault. So I uh, didn't send the card, took a step back, and realized that not only that, that I had started writing that card because somebody called and told me that he was talking smack about me on social media and I felt triggered and now I'm thanking him and realizing I was writing the thank you note which also was going to have boundaries. I wasn't completely, you know, pushed over and begging for a connection. I didn't want it. I was trying to set boundaries, but saying thank you to avoid the consequence of calling him out on behavior. So when I realized I was writing the note in the middle of an active smear campaign against me, I stopped and realized again, look at how triggered I just got. I was acting out of trauma, making decisions out of my, my trauma and my energetic and cognitive patterns that weren't serving me at all. They're, I was not going to benefit at all from continuing contact. And so what I want to communicate to you today is that whether this is the first time you've heard anything about this or whether you've been following us and other creators and researchers and therapists who are talking about this, no matter where you're at, there's something really important to know about the spiral of recovery. Um, and it's like one way we joke about that is that it's like I get the same lesson over and over and over and over and over. And that is what happens because our patterns are how we see the lesson, but also how we create the circumstances in our life to keep that going. That is not victim blaming at all. I'm just saying, if you're not recognizing a pattern, you can't change it to become more who you are, which is our goal here. So back to the story, that spiral of recovery had me going around some areas that I have worked on for years. And I wanted you to know, and I wanted me to know, that I'm in a different place. And so when you think about a spiral of recovery, you know how we talk about like, don't spiral down, you spiral up too. And as you're spiral, spiraling up, there are some ways to know that you are making progress. The most important way is to keep track of your progress. And if you don't journal, fine by me. Take notes in your phone. Chart it, draw it, whatever you want. Just recognize it and say it out loud that you are changing, you are healing, you are making progress in whatever it is you're aiming for. So recognizing progress is the number one way to keep it going, right? Because when we don't feel like we're making progress, what do most of us do, especially with complex trauma? We quit or we avoid or we over-engage and, and burn ourselves out, okay? So number two, so first of all, progress, track it. Just know that you're improving. The second thing is that you will notice that there's shorter recovery times. 
Okay. So that whole thing that I told you about learning, I was being targeted, writing a thank you note, coming to my senses and making decisions about what to do next took about two and a half hours, right? It was very uncomfortable two and a half hours, but not that long. And that used to take two weeks a couple of years ago. And before I really realized what was going on two months, I would get really sick. It would literally end up with me being sick physically as well as mentally. I mean, that's horrible to be in a chronic condition like that. So the back to the point, you're looking for shorter recovery times. And at first it may not be as dramatic as what I just described because I'm describing five to 10 years of hard work, right? At first you might just notice that you didn't have to yell back because you know it won't matter anyway and you're conserving your energy, not because you're giving up or hiding, right? You might also notice that you don't feel bad about yourself quite as long or as much or as meanly. Like maybe you have negative, less negative self-talk. Even when I realized that I was writing, I'm still laughing about it. Even when I realized that I was writing a thank you note to my abuser, I find that funny because I, it's like cute little me. I'm still in those patterns. Let's figure out what we need to do. And I'm really not trying to minimize it. I just have been around the block so many times that you too can feel like the irony of what's happening in your life. So we have keeping track of progress and noticing recovery periods or skills that you're using, right? It's number two. And number three is to start looking for nuance. You might find nuance in a lot of different places and it might be that you have a different viewpoint of what happened before. It might be like you don't feel as um, obligated or stuck to people, please. There are lots of different ways to find nuance. Look for the small things that are changing in you too. Okay. And I just wanted to remind you that you're not alone. A lot of us have walked this road and are still walking this road. And there are a lot of resources available to you. So if you are interested in more resources, please, if you're a professional, consider the AIT basics course coming up. If you are a consumer, somebody who is in recovery themselves, or maybe a loved one is in recovery, we have a couple of guides that are going to be coming online um, the first week in January about how to know if you have CPTSD um, and how to find a therapist. So we'll have a, a workbook as well as some video for you to track with that. And that's of course free. I just want people to begin their journey of recovery. So look for those things. Um, and if you want to be notified about when we have new releases like that, you can go sign up uh, for our newsletter. Just head over to the cptsdpodcast.com and everything will be there for you to find and click right at the top. We'll make it easy. The takeaway from today is that as you're entering recovery, plan to plan, be aware, count on it, that your recovery is going to take time and that that is okay. You're worth time and you're worth effort. The same lessons will come around to help us mature and to find nuance and depth in our recovery. And that is sustainable. That is feeling like you're a different person and have a different life, sustainable. And that helps us, that sustainable recovery helps us become more of ourselves. And that heals our whole being. I'm so grateful you're here. Like, share, and subscribe. And um, I look forward to talking with Lisa Boker in our next podcast. We're going to be talking about her approach and thoughts about trauma. So please tune in for that on the 7th. And in the meantime, breathe and take it easy. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.